Welcome to the 461st episode of the Reading and Writing Podcast. Stay tuned for my interview with Janet Stilson, author of the new novel, The Juice. Stay tuned for the interview. Welcome back to the Reading and Writing Podcast. My guest today is Janet Stilson, author of the new novel, The Juice. Janet, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. I'm really pleased to be here. Great. If someone hasn't heard about your novel, The Juice, yet, how would you describe the novel? It's about, it's set largely inside the corridors of a giant media company, a couple of media companies, actually, and it's set a few decades into the future. That's the overall world of the story. And it's a world that I know very well because I've, as a reporter, I've covered big media companies for too many years to admit to. And in this, I've written it as a dystopian cyberpunk tale. And it's about a government controlled media company that uses a secret substance to tighten its grip on the public's thought patterns. And three unlikely allies come together to stop it. There's a rebel tech head, a dirt poor, fearless teen, and an ambitious, tough executive. Do you remember the original impetus or idea that led you to write The Juice? I don't think that there was any one thing that happened. I think that I've been writing in the sci-fi genre for a while now, and I've always kept my life as a journalist separate from my creative writing life. But a lot of the interviews that I've done over the years with executives at big media companies have been focused on the future, what new shows or other forms of content are coming down the pike, what new technology they're experimenting with. And so I just started to fantasize what it would be like to work within a giant media company a few decades into the future. And also along with that, you know, how they might evolve their abilities to influence us to buy certain products or do certain things. What was your writing journey prior to writing The Juice? I started out writing fiction from the time I was a little kid. And when I became more serious about it in college, the short story form was my my favorite jumping off point. And then I got into writing film scripts and had some success in that one of my scripts was selected to be part of the Writer's Lab for Women, which is sponsored by Meryl Streep, Nicole Kidman, and Oprah. And it was also selected to be part of uh, Stowe Story Labs. And while I loved writing film scripts, and I still do, and I'm, I write TV scripts as well, It was liberating to turn my attention to a novel because you can really engage all five senses and really describe things much more elaborately than you can if you're writing a film script, which is more like a skeleton that other people add their creative layers to. I really enjoyed writing The Juice, but it took me a long time to really figure out, crystallize what the story should be and to really understand how to write a novel, which is like swimming across the ocean, as I like to say, in comparison to writing a film script. It's just a much longer process. Sure. So what was it like to go through the Writer's Lab for Women program? As you mentioned, it's sponsored by Meryl Streep and Nicole Kidman. It was amazing. It was The way they format it is they take a group of writers, 12 writers, away to a retreat, and they team them up with two mentors, two very seasoned, largely female people. I was teamed up with Meg LaFauve, who was an Oscar-nominated writer who was nominated for her work on Inside Out, the Pixar movie, and also, what is her name? Mary Jane Skalski who is a very seasoned producer of independent films in particular. And they really took the script that I had written, which is called Jaguar Trail. They just took it apart 
And as much as I thought I was pretty hot stuff for having even gotten into this lab, they really took me down a peg or two and made me understand that it could be a lot better than what I had given them to read. And it was kind of like being, I like to think of it as being, I was like in the minor leagues and I had these major league players that were really forcing me to, to up my game. So it was, it was a great experience. And one of the best parts of it was meeting the other writers that were part of the lab. We still um, stay in very close contact and help each other with our giving feedback on our writing projects. That's great. When you have an idea for a story, do you know if it will be a short story, a novel, or a story? I have to play it out in my head in terms of how much story there is. Right now, I'm working on a sci-fi TV series, but I also see it as a novel. And I tested it out in the short story format just to see if I could contain it in 10 pages and then use that as a jumping off point for doing longer versions of the story. So it depends. If something is very, there's a section of the juice that I actually is contained called Imaginary Children. It's the storyline of the television executive that I mentioned when I was describing it. And it was it was so easy to see it as a film script that I decided to take that story out and I actually first excerpted it and sent it to Asimov's magazine and they published it last summer. And then I wrote a film script that was based on that. That's great. What was your writing process while you were working on the juice? Do you outline did you outline the novel extensively or were you more of an organic writer as you were working on it? There were the first few drafts were totally organic and then I realized that I really had to get my act together and so I started um outlining it and that was absolutely the key to finding the structure and getting the story as as good as I could get it. And are you working on another novel? I have the seeds of one in my head. I haven't started actually writing it yet, but that's definitely something that I'm taking notes on. Given your work as a journalist and now a novelist and also writing scripts, what writing advice would you offer for those who are working on their own stories or novels or scripts? I think that the number one thing for me is to really dedicate a certain amount of time almost every single day to work on your story, even if you feel distracted, if you have a million things to do, to just, I really feel like sometimes I'm a she-wolf with my pops in the sense that I say, no, this is my time. I'm doing this no matter what. Because you need that discipline in order to get anything done. And if you let days go by, then you lose momentum. You lose the sort of juices, the creative juices that you've built up. You didn't. Uh, yep. I thought you learned your lesson. I guess not. Dad, the vultures are back. Okay, kids, you know the drill. Windows up. Gone too far looking for a good deal on gas? Try Price Match, only from BP Me Rewards at participating BP and Amico stations. Learn more at bp.com slash best price. Maddie's believes nature is beautiful, majestic, serene. But human nature is inventive, intrepid, reckless. Nature says, look how many colors I can fit in a sunset. Human nature says, look how many hot wings I can fit in my mouth. But human nature needs nature. That's why there's Maddie's All Natural Acid and Indigestion Relief, a drug-free remedy for human nature, available at Walmart, CVS, Walgreens, and Amazon. These statements have not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration. This product is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. And so what novels or nonfiction books have you read recently that you enjoyed and that you would recommend? I absolutely fell in love with Octavia Butler's. She has two books, a two book series that she did. The first one is called Parable of the Sower. And the second is Parable of the Talents. Have you read them? I'm familiar with them. I haven't read them. Yeah, I was just really blown away with them. She creates a dystopian America and but she didn't even she just didn't leave it creating the the world of the story and what 
America would look like into the future. But she also had one of her main characters create a her own religion, which plays a key a key sort of plot point through the two novels. And I thought that was pretty amazing. I also a little further back in time, fell in love with Am- Amor Towles, who wrote a book called The Gentleman in Moscow. Or yeah, Gentleman in Moscow, I think it is. Do you know that? I haven't read it, but again, I've heard many people mention it. In fact, I was interviewing someone earlier this morning and they mentioned it. <laughs> yeah, it's it's pretty incredible, especially for, for people who have a love for Russian uh, literature. He really pays tribute to it over the course of the the book. Yeah, but I'm a I'm a big fan of William Gibson and Philip Pullman and David Mitchell. They're all people I gravitate toward. Great. Where can people find you online if they want to learn more about you and your novel, The Juice? I have my own website, which is JanetStilson.com, and that's the primary place to go. I'd say. Great. Well, again, we've been speaking with Janet Stilson, author of the new novel, The Juice. The novel is on sale now, so go buy a copy. And Janet, thanks for doing this interview. It was absolutely my pleasure. Now, stay tuned as Janet Stilson reads from her novel, The Juice. Hello, I'm Janet Stilson, reading an excerpt from my sci-fi novel, The Juice. One of the main characters, Jared, just received a disturbing message from his friend Tom. Tom was attacked and a precious substance called The Juice was stolen. In this passage, Jared goes back in time to a period when he and Tom were attending MIT in Cambridge. Jared knows that Tom has been working on a very secret experiment and he's about to discover what it's all about. It started to become apparent early one morning when I was walking home through Cambridge. Tom hadn't been around in days. He had sent me a message to say he had some sort of flu and wouldn't be in class or at the lab. There wasn't anything recognizable about Tom from a distance. He just seemed like an elite who was a bit tipsy, weaving happily down Massachusetts Avenue. As we drew closer to each other, he looked up, and I nearly fell over in shock. There was nothing flu-like about him. He seemed extraordinarily healthy, so alluring, so relaxed, beautiful even. His busy black eyes were celestial now, lapis lazuli blue with crackles of emerald, velvety as butterfly wings. He'd always seemed asexual to me. But now I had no doubt that women would do anything to bed him down. In fact, I felt the faint urge, even though I'd never been attracted to men before. I was too stunned for anything beyond, what the bloody fuck? Calm down. It was a god-awful scent coming out of his mouth. A cat piss odor, but laced with bourbon. It was weirdly irresistible. So this is your secret. You've been experimenting on yourself. Tom grabbed my shirt, shouting, You don't know anything about my experiment. You never saw me like this. Don't ever, ever tell anyone. Okay, got it. Took all my mental focus to keep from kissing him. There was only one way to stop it. I pushed him away hard and he fell to the sidewalk. If it's such a bloody secret, then what are you doing wandering around town looking like this, I asked. He knew I had a point. We weren't that far from school. Thousands of students and professors recognized Tom by sight, even if they didn't know him personally. He certainly would attract a great deal of attention looking the way he did now. Tom managed to get on on his feet, wobbling a bit. Guess I'm pretty wasted. I rolled my eyes. Come on. I pulled him down one street after another towards his flat, trying to deal with the strange new thrill of being near him. It was confusing and exciting. We finally reached the place where Tom lived, a swank resort apartment complex that attracted elites from Asia. Can you get upstairs okay? (laughs) Ha! I'm a brilliant stair climber. He started weaving up the steps, but then turned back to me. You're going to forget this happened, right? I nodded yes. 
How could I say no to anything he asked? Then again, how could I possibly forget? That afternoon, Tom stumbled into a class about ten minutes into the lecture. He sat down next to me with a wary glance. His eyes were black again and unusually dull, and he'd thrown on a stiff, blazing white shirt. When the class finally ended, we walked across campus. I was a good six inches taller than Tom. That added to the awkwardness as I studied his face for clues. Hangover? (laughs) That's the least of it. What in bloody hell had he done to himself? I knew better than to ask. I know this isn't something you can forget, Tom said. I shouldn't have demanded that. Yeah, that was a pretty dim hope. Tom reached up and grabbed my shirt urgently. All the attraction I had felt hours ago was gone now, and I nearly reeled back from Tom's intimacy. I know I can trust you more than anyone. He was so earnestly desperate. Uh Uh-huh. So why don't you tell me what you're doing? Fear washed over his face. I can't. Then he took off. I was so pissed that he couldn't trust me with the most basic top-line information. That feeling stuck around for quite some time. That night, I went inside a virtual reality portal called Six Deep. There was a vault inside that housed all my holographic graffiti. My avatar, which looked exactly like me, was busy sorting out the jumble of imagery when Tom's own selfie avatar showed up. He had his private graffiti vault nearby, and we'd shared the hand gestures that unlocked each other's bins quite some time ago. So he slipped into mine quickly enough. We were completely alone. Charismite. That's what I became last night. That's what you saw, Tom's avatar said. Charis who? Charismite, as in someone with extraordinary charisma. I took some juice, what I formulated back at the lab, and it made me that way. Juice? That's the best you can do for a name? I'm not interested in some cocked-up marketing brand. A few more tweaks and I can persuade anybody to do anything with this substance, Just down a few milligrams and pow, I'm going to change the friggin' world. That sounds evil. Why do something like that? No, you've got it all wrong. I've got something quite extraordinarily good in mind. You'll see. I'm Janet Stilson. Thank you for listening to this excerpt from my novel, The Juice.